the Beer to Whiskey Studios, high atop Barley's Tap Room on Main Street in downtown Greenville, South Carolina. I'm Russ Heaps, and welcome to this segment of Beer to Whiskey. This is one of our Big John uh, Beer 101 segments in which John gives us some sort of basic... Uh, beer knowledge. Beer knowledge, yeah. That's well, well <laughs> Drop put. Drop in knowledge. Well put, well put. <laughs> uh, Big John Richards, of course, is a buddy of mine, and he's, he's well known in the upstate here in South Carolina for his beer knowledge and, and beer acumen. Um, but before we get into that, uh, I just want to say that, that we would like for you to click like if you like this uh, and, and subscribe if you want to subscribe. And Big John, how do they do that? There's a little blue Facebook thumbs up right down below the video window. And there's a subscribe button so that whenever we do one of these Beer 101s, you can get your beer knowledge too. That's right. Um, we put up a new video uh, every Thursday at all oh, about noon East Coast time. And uh, so we, we'd like you to be a regular with us. And with that, uh, what Big John's going to do today, this is Beer 101, and what he wants to do is the big seven styles of beer. So Big John, take it away. Let's do it. Um, first of all, they're probably wondering what we have in front of us, which is uh, a porter by the unknown brewery in Charlotte called Teleporter. And we're going to cheers to that and take a sip because, well, frankly, I'm, drinking's the fun part. That's right. That's, yeah. I wouldn't do this if we didn't drink. Cheers. Cheers. Texas Miss Lily. And what a wonderful porter it is. Wow, that is a traditional porter. Yeah. It's all coffee and chocolate. It's all roast, coffee, chocolate. Yep. Still smooth, still, you know, medium bodied, easy drinking. Yep. Quality stuff. Very nice. Yeah. So we're going to dive right into what I've come to, to call the big seven beer styles. We're not going to hit, we're really not going to hit Belgium. We're not going to hit Sours. Um, some of the small off the radar styles that still don't accumulate a lot of um, the volume of brewing. Okay. okay. So these are the big seven. They're kind of the most recognized, the, the biggest, easiest, most available beer styles around. Um, and there's obviously room for interpretation on which ones are the biggest ones, but these are mine, and it's me on this show, so I get to pick. You know, and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay, because my day job, I'm an auto journalist, and I've done stories on, on classic cars, and if you, if, anytime I did a story on the 10 greatest muscle cars of all times, oh my God, people came yeah. out of the woodwork on these things, so I and, get it, And John. they will here, too, yeah. so <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> All right, so we're going to work our way um, in beer styles from lightest to darkest. Sometimes I say from easiest to hardest, but that's not always the case. Okay. Um, especially working this way. Some people jump in at different points along this scale and uh, never make it back to the light stuff or never make it to the dark stuff. It's hard to say. But the uh, world's most recognizable beer style is clearly Pilsner, and that's where we're going to start. So Pilsner's a lager. And it's really the only lager on the list we're going to cover, even though there's a bunch of different lager styles. Sure. But, and this is what we call a teaser. In some other future episode, we're going to actually have an entire episode on yeast and what it does to beer and the difference between ale and lager, what it really is. So, but we're this, not doing that today. This is as big a surprise to me as it is to you. <laughs> so, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so Pilsner is that style that started in 1842 in Pilsen, Germany. Uh, with the town fathers really dedicating their town to making this brand new golden straw-colored lager clear sure. beer, and uh, when when it hit it big and Germany jumped on the bandwagon, and next thing you know, we're shipping rail cars full of bright-colored, refreshing beer all around the world. Glass was new at the time, so Pilsner just became this big, beautiful thing that had never happened before and took over the world in 100 years. So in, by the 1970s, everybody was drinking Pilsner, and that's all that was being brewed in the United States almost. More on that later as well. But Pilsner is just what you think it is. The big American brands, they lay claim to Pilsner. I don't know. There's some argument whether they can really be true Pilsner beers or not, but that's what they are at their heart. 
and then you got the you know the the real like Pilsner Urkel is one of the real recognizable ones that comes from uh, Czech Republic and so you know you get some of these the and like Heineken's an international Pilsner and so all these really bright golden beers that are really refreshing and light and all the light calorie beers they all kind of lump in together but uh, you know if you're talking all malt Pilsner which is the way it typically gets graded it's a uh, it, it can't have corn and rice okay Pilsner is that that's what Pilsner really is is that whole category of light beer so my understanding from talking to to brewers uh, that Pilsner is really difficult to make that it's it's trickier to make than something like we're drinking here extraordinarily simply because you cannot make a mistake that's exactly right you're brewing something that light and that's one of the reasons we that the brewing community looks at Budweiser as having created some kind of miracle because you can drink a Budweiser anywhere in any corner any street corner in the world and it's basically the same beer Right, and it's and it's consistent every time. It's quality every time. It is a, it is a model of consistency. Yep, and a lot of a lot of American, even small scale American brewers, especially small scale American brewers, really struggle to find that consistency in the same way. There's plenty of plenty of brew pubs you can go to where you show up one day and their pale ale tastes sweet malty and you show up the next day and it tastes uh, hoppy and bitter because yeah. it's just hard to keep it consistent right. and with Pilsner the reason that's one of the big reasons is you don't see a lot of lagers being brewed in the craft world and number two is that they just take a long time to really brew a quality Pilsner and get it to market it's you know you're six or eight weeks out at the bare minimum typically to get through fermentation and cold lagering so that was those two things are the big hang-ups with why we don't see a lot of craft lagers nowadays we're starting to see a lot more because we're starting to see some of the brewers who have picked up national and even regional status brewing a good lager because they found out that hey people really want this and are willing to pay you know four bucks a beer five bucks a beer at the bar for a quality beer versus three bucks a beer for something else all right so i think covering pilsner any more extensively would eat at the rest of our time so right. i jump farther to the next darkest beer which is really wheat beers and even though wheat beers are kind of an ancillary side uh style they fit in here because they're they're a big old world style and you see a lot of especially German beers coming to the states that are wheat beers and then American brewers a lot of the early ones made their fortunes as it were with uh, with some kind of a Hefeweizen some kind of an unfiltered wheat beer so that really figures into a lot of what we drink here so it, it jumps into my beer styles and wheat beer is really very close to what you would do um, taste wise with a light lager but it's a creamier a um, little richer texture okay. and you're going to carry a little bit more aggressive flavors with it so it's going to pull some of the banana up front um, a little of the kind of creamy wheat sweetness and then usually clove in the finish if it's done in the very German traditional style and once again those are all yeast flavors and then a lot of American brewers have Americanized the style so much that we have American wheat beer now which is uh, usually hopped with American hops you get a little more citrusy and a little more uh, dry and a little lighter bodied than you typically would with a real Hefeweizen. Uh, but any of those are going to come off cloudy and hazy. You're going to recognize that real unfiltered look to it. It'll have a little bit of sediment in it. You sometimes see some floaties from off the bottom of the bottle and none of those are bad. They're all just a product of it being an unfiltered beer, which is what beer always and was up until a couple hundred years and ago. And that's the nutrition. And that's it. it. So, yeah, right? full of vitamins. As you have pointed full out. Full of vitamins. That's the where all the where all the good for you stuff yep. is yep which is another reason why one of my it's my favorite to always get the last pint out of the barrel <laughs> because it's got all the stuff in it <laughs> yep so we jump out of wheat beers and i'll quickly just name like Weinstefan or hefeweizen paul um uh spaten uh, they're all the big german breweries that you see that have those if you see weiss or Weizen or Weiss beer it's all the same stuff it's all okay all describing that same unfiltered um, hazy refreshing summertime beer and then the American stuff you can see it everywhere um, Sierra Nevada's got Keller Weiss it's very traditional one of our locals Brody 5 does that 864 Weizen with our area code on it 
Um, the Pyramid Hefeweizen from out in Seattle is one of the old, old, old school American Weizens. Um, they're pretty much everywhere. Um, Kona from out in Hawaii makes washout wheat. Basically, we're looking at the same kind of beer. So anywhere you see wheat in the United States, you're looking at that Weizen beer. Okay. Uh, moving from that, we move into Pale Ale, which is where American beer really got its start. And Pale Ale is a, a, a kind of a more modern beer style on the grand world scale of things because it wasn't until the late 1700s that it really became a thing at all. Uh, most beer up to that point was unfiltered, muddy, and brown. And that was about as far as we got. And you could, you could make it taste some different ways and creating different ingredients that would make it a little bit different. But most beer was that muddy brown color, and that was just how it was. Yeah. And uh, with the invention of kilning and indirect roasting and being able to dry malts without burning, without literally having them catch on fire, we got to do all kinds of different colors in our beer now, uh, which eventually led to Pilsner and, and eventually led to Stout in different time periods. With pale ale, anything that wasn't this color was called pale ale for a long, long time. So it just, this was uh, umbrella, anything covered it. Nowadays, it's something much more specific. And we have American Pale Ale, which is basically like what Sierra Nevada made and created an empire out of. Sure. It created a world beer movement out of basically throwing that Pale Ale into supermarkets and letting people get a taste of what American hops would taste like. It was just a revolution. So. We have pale ale now, and pale ale has gotten uh, kind of shoved off into the dusty corner of, of American brewing for a long time because it just wasn't super exciting. But now that brewing has kind of moved its way back into, hey, you know what, we're going we're gonna to try for some reasonable alcohol strengths. We're going to come back to porter, we're going to come back to brown, and we're going to come back to pale ale and, and brew these 5 and 6% beers that people can drink several of and you know still get up and walk away yep. like i like to say <laughs> yep um pale ale is definitely making a resurgence but i definitely distinguish it from ipa which we're about to get to because pale ale really is that is its own thing it jumps off into like ambers live in the pale ale world so if you're running around and you see an amber or a red ale it really lives in that pale ale category and uh all of those are going to be your smooth, balanced, easy drinking American ales. And then you'll see like Bass. Bass is one of the classic world pale ales. Um, back to some of the other English, I mean, frankly, a lot of these are pointing back to English styles, even getting into the, their bitters and the ESB that became a style. Okay. And all of that kind of all fits into pale ale. So it's, a, it's still a big umbrella category, but not quite to the extent that it used to be. And then moving rapidly, as you rapidly can, as I can. Sip. You I'm can gonna. Take a sip. It's I'm running out of room. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Plus, we gotta wet the whistle. Exactly. So, uh, and like I said, drinking's the fun part. And that's is. a good beer. It is nice. <laughs> I'm getting to drink while you're. I know. I'm I dead. love these 101 <laughs> things because I don't have to do anything. <laughs> All right. So IPA. Everybody knows IPA. You love it or you hate it. It's one of those things. It exists. It is the third most consumed beer style in the world right now. Is that right? That is correct. Um, and it is a big deal. A lot of people like IPAs. And I recognize, everybody recognizes that IPA is an aggressive beer. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people come in and love it. Some people come in and hate it. It's just who you are. There's nothing to worry, you know, if you don't like IPAs, you don't need to feel bad about yourself. And if you do like IPAs, you don't need to feel bad about yourself. <laughs> it's, it's beer. It just is what it is. God. That's right, exactly. So with IPAs, you're going to see the gamut of clear, bright, uh, refreshing, dry, 5% alcohol stuff to big, honky tonkin, you know, double IPAs that knock you right on the floor after two. Sure. They all kind of fit into the, I mean, if you're going Brewers Association styles, there's a smaller window that they fit into. But in the real world, on the store shelves, IPA is a big range of things. From session IPA to double and triple IPA, it all lives under that same bitter beer window. 
And don't let anybody tell you that bitter is a bad thing. We are blessed, as far as I'm concerned, to be the only animal species on the planet that doesn't automatically recognize bitter as a, a poisonous flavor. Look at people who drink espresso. Nobody looks down on them. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that in the beer world anybody's looking down on IPA drinkers. You know what? Someday, sometimes it is the case these days. People are like, oh, you like IPAs. You must be a fake lumberjack. I'm like, <laughs> oh. It's not true. IPAs are still delicious. Don't let anybody tell you. <laughs> I... Right. I'm ambivalent. So, right. you know, I... In the, in the straight up description category, though, we're back to that. Yeah. You know, it can be almost anything. Hey, the telephone's ringing. Telephone's ringing. That's right. See, these things are live. <laughs> <laughs> In case you couldn't tell already. And hopefully somebody's going to answer the phone. Right. You never can tell, though. No, there may not be anybody up here. <laughs> Sometimes they leave us alone. Yeah. So it's just going to ring right. for a while. But that's, that's okay. That's okay. We're going to get back to talking IPAs. Yeah. So you're talking um, with traditional IPA, it's going to be north of 6%. Uh, south of seven and a half and you're going to be in that sort of range it's going to be pale amber in color kind of copper it's going to have a big bitter front typically and a dry finish and usually a big multi backbone to help balance things down you know session it's going to have less of that multi backbone it's going to be more dry and more light you go to double it's going to have more of that multi backbone and more sweetness and more even balance to it sometimes because those hops are being right um you know you're you're knocking the edge off with the sweetness of the yep. sugars and the residuals that are in there so a lot of lot to explore in ipa and and, and rightfully so there's just a lot that can be done with hops sure. hops are a beautiful thing all right on onwards and upwards um, the ne so we're we're now moving really into darker styles and the next big beer style is brown ale Brown ale is... Now we're in my wheel. Right. <laughs> brown ale is what all beer used to be, like we were just talking about. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was all brown. It was all unfiltered. It was all kind of muddy. It all kind of tasted the same and usually tasted smoky. Yep. Because you'd have to roast your grains over a fire. Nowadays, brown ale is much more of an intro beer. It's a light-bodied, often 4 or 5% alcohol, very smooth... Um, you'll usually get some chocolate notes, maybe a little bit of roast, some smooth kind of like cold brew coffee flavors sometimes are a lot of fun. And brewers are doing some really fun things with brown ale these days. we got like D9 in, in uh, Charlotte's making that brown sugar brown cow. It yep, tastes like which, a milkshake. Yep, which is wonderful. And there's a lot of those browns that are coming out that are really rich and, and full bodied and lots of residual sweetness to them. And and then some of the brown, and then some of the traditional brown ales that still come out smoky and really roasted, but they're still light bodied. They're going to live in that four to six percent range. Um, they're going to be really accessible. They're typically going to be not more than medium bodied, um, but they're definitely going to be that darker color. Not quite to this, uh, which we're coming up to next. But the nice thing about browns is sort of. It's sort of a nice gateway into... It's a great gateway beer. Yeah. It's a great gateway into, beer. I mentioned this. Ambers earlier, Browns. They're, they're both great gateway beers into craft if you're used to something, uh, if you're used to the American macros. Because right. they're, they're not aggressive. They're smooth. They're usually pretty sweet. Um, they're just accessible. Yep. And we use that, throw that term around a lot, but that's really what that term is for, is that it's, you know, it... Anything with aggressive flavors is going to be hard to, to just jump right into with both feet. Sure. Uh, whereas a lot of these lighter beers, and even getting into porter, a lot of people are jumping in on that one because it's, got, it's just accessible. Um, and speaking of porter, that's what we've got in front of us here. And this is one of those very traditional, you, you really do get a little bit of the smoke, you get the coffee, you get the roast, you get the dark chocolate. It's, when I order a porter, this is exactly what I expect. Right. I'm going to sip again because I can <laughs> and it's just there's no there's no rules <laughs> it's true <laughs> what a wonderful product and this is really the first one that popped up a lot of people a, a, a lot of people think that you know stouts gave way to porters but it's really the other way around porter came first and uh, it was really Guinness's doing that took porter around the world so we got these 
like we talked about indirect fire and the kilning process and this kind of thing and and there's a, an invention in 1817 way back called the cylindrical roaster that actually let us sp uh, spin these uh, uh, malt kernels while they're roasting and cover them with water cool water mist while they're roasting so that they don't catch fire and we turn them black and porter started out not quite this black in the 1700s until we really got to be able to do like black patent malt which is just burnt alt crap and it creates all this dark chocolate and coffee flavor that's in here because of all the roast that's been sure. in, all the fire that's been yep. put to it and uh but it still doesn't taste burnt uh although sometimes i do like to talk about burnt bread crust flavors that i think are wonderful in beers well you can get you can get porters that are a little bitter yeah you certainly can. And this isn't one of them. Right. But you can get some that are that and way. The, and the less you have in residual sugars, the less you will have, the more you will have a bitter backbone to the beer. In any case, and that's why IPAs tend to be that way because you're throwing a lot of bitterness in there without a lot of residual sugars to help balance it down. When we start getting further into the darker beers and bigger and more alcohol, they have much more residual sugars to balance all that out. Uh, with Porter, you're in the say five and a half to six and a half percent range you're going to be talking about a very dark beer but if you hold it up to the light you'd probably see kind of some ruby and some dark brown around the edges um, that is just a product of not fully dousing it with that black malt it creates a black beer but still kind of light around the edges which lets you know you're getting that instead of a stout. Um, with porter, you're going to get especially very coffee flavors. They're very prevalent in porter. You're going to get some dark roast and some d chocolate flavors very often. But you're going to get that light to medium body and that dry finish that really clean up nice and let you um, go back for another sip really quickly. Just to jump in, this is as good a porter, I think, as I've ever had. I agree. And it, it, it's teleporter out of the unknown brewery in unknown charlotte. brewery in charlotte yeah find your way into charlotte it's a good place to visit yep yep so moving from porter um once again we're talking guinness and at one point guinness was selling one out of every four beers in the world is that right guinness yeah and that's kind of i mean awesome yeah yeah <laughs> so guinness did porter for a long long time and started brewing what they called an export stout for you know because if you're shipping beer away having a little higher alcohol content helps preserve it so for export they brewed it at like seven and a half and with that little bit of extra alcohol it would help preserve the beer for travel to wherever it was going right and so when guinness export stout became a thing it was a stout porter and then eventually just became a stout and so when you talk about stouts, you're really talking, we harken back to that whole thing, but okay. stout has become its own thing now. Much more since, well, even going back to the original reason we have Russian Imperial Stout was Catherine the Great wanted stout in her court. And bless her heart. Bless her heart, because she got a shipment of stout that had been, that had been brought over, uh, landed in, well, I guess it was probably St. Petersburg at the time. And uh, it was all spoiled. And Catherine the Great was rightfully put, uh, put off. off. She was a little on Put off. And when you get the name Catherine the Great, you're pretty much going to get what you want. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, I want not spoiled beer. And uh, got a, and, and so we went up to like 8.5% alcohol shipped it over there with this big monstrous at that time unheard right. of alcohol strength and got over there and it was you know aged for six months and so it was turning smooth and was just this beautiful thing that we've come to know today as a stout russian imperial stout and uh and god bless catherine the great <laughs> she's got my vote right so uh so that's what we're talking about we get into stout is a even higher alcohol content more dark the more alcohol, the more sweetness you're going to get from that and residual sweetness that's typically going to be left over. So you're going to have a bigger, fuller bodied. Now we're talking a very full bodied, full mouth feel, heavy duty, oily, rich beer. But Guinness isn't that 
big alcohol. Guinness, wine. no Guinness that we get in this country is four four point two, right. it's, yeah, which it's, still leans way back into that porter category. Yeah, Guinness just feels heavy because it's nitrogenated yep. instead of carbonated. Carbonation makes your tongue taste more, and it sort of livens up everything that happens. It's it's effervescent on your tongue, and so when you taste something that's carbonated, it tastes lighter. It feels lighter than something that's nitrogenated, which just sits because it doesn't have any carbonation to lift those flavors off your tongue. Now, it does let you taste some of those more subtle flavors, but you, you take one, it's, you're taking one to get one. So with Russian Imperial Stout, when you get into the real stouts, and even if you got into real Guinness Export Stout, it's going to have more of those big, full chocolate, chocolate milk kind of flavors, those real rich, dextrin-based sugars are in there to give you that full syrupy mouthfeel. It looks and pours like motor oil when it comes out of the can. But you're, some of these beers are really heavily hopped too because with that much sweetness you got to throw a, a little bitter backbone to it to help hold everything together. So you're going to get those real rich flavors with a little bit of the bite that holds everything from getting cloying or sweet. Right, which is why you're not you're not a uh, a big uh, cheerleader for the BTU. Right, IBU. IBU. I'm sorry. BTUs are BTU, it's yeah air conditioning. Right. I don't know. What I'm, <laughs> I'm, it could be anything I've though. I've a little beer, so it's <laughs> IBU. So that's yeah. why you're not because of that Agreed. residual sugar. Exactly. Effect. It's. IBUs, as I've said, are a math problem describing how your beer is going to taste. Yeah. And if you like describing your beer in terms of math, you probably will do fine with IBUs. But I like tasting my beer. And it's just different. Perceived bitterness is so different from actual IBUs, it's hard to even correlate the two. Yep. Yep. I think we covered most of it. I didn't really get into ABV strength with stouts, but stouts, like I said, are going to start at that really start at that 7.5. Although you'll see a few people brew a stout that's at 6% alcohol, um, which is really, really trending back towards what porter really is, or the original stout yeah. porters, okay. just with a little more black patent malt and a little more aggressive flavors thrown in there. Um, most of them are going to be in that 7.5 to maybe 8.5. And then by the time you get to eight, eight and a half, and nine, you're into imperial stout, and that can go up to almost into real scary numbers. Yeah, into, <laughs> into the barley wine right territory. Exactly. Yep. yep. Uh, well, I think we've had a pretty good uh, little tutorial here on Big John's Big Seven styles of beer. Right. Um, and with that. Again, want to thank uh, Bartley's Tap Room for inviting us up here and letting us shoot this here. And until next time, here's to it. Cheers. <laughs>